Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me a great pleasure to be with you today. I would like to thank the organizing committee for accepting my uh, abstract and presenting this um, nice work about recessive uh, genetic causes of early onset epileptic encephalopathy. Let's see how does this work. Yes. So my roadmap, we are going to talk about the ep early onset epileptic encephalopathy. How is it common? Is it important or not? What is our aim from our study? How we did it? What is the result conclusion? So the ep early onset epileptic encephalopathy are really big heterogeneous group of clinical and genetic um, uh, disorders. They, they are all presented early before two years of age and uh, characterized by intractable seizure, unremitted interactal um, paroxysmal epileptic uh, form activity. Uh, the problem that there is different in their presentation. Sometimes uh, the, the age at uh, onset of the seizure, the presence of pattern of clinical uh, EEG, and the identification of the cause, it's, it's difficult. And also there's another problem that the etiological classification for it is really difficult to diagnose what is the cause of this epileptic encephalopathy. Is it structural? Is it um, chromosomal? Is it going with only hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy or not? So um, I'm not a neurologist, I'm a geneticist only, but I'm, I'm uh, receiving a lot of patients coming from the neurology clinic because of this problem. Um, so they are common. Most of those are refractory to the anti-epileptic drugs. Uh, they present a dilemma challenge for us, and we thought to use the advances, advance of the genomic technology to facilitate our discoveries, especially that when we compare in the, in the other countries, most of their um, causes are autosomal dominant, which is not in our country. We have a lot of three or four affected in the family, so it is mostly autosomal recessive. This is a slide of unpublished data from Prince Sultan Military Medical City, and we find in 370 patients, the most common cause of, neuro of epileptic encephalopathy in general was um, like 21% was neurometabolic, 24 was hypoxic, eximis, uh, hypoxic, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and some of uh, brain malformation. The unknown were around unexplained were as around 32%. So we, our aim is to identify the underlying genetic defect in highly consanguineous population. You know, in our population, we have around 49% of consanguinity in, in a journal, and in those patients, around Nine, more than 90% in those patients, and if you say that they are from the same tribe, 99%. So the method was um, from two centers, from Prince Sultan Military Hospital and from Dr. Fozan also lab. We perform a genetic, um, um, we collect the patient, a cohort study, a cohort patient, uh, all of them with unexplained early onset epileptic encephalopathy from Riyadh. We, uh, from this period, we included, sorry, Go back. Yes, we included all patients with early onset of uh, seizure from the first two years of life. Sorry for this, my presentation was better, but you know the text is different from between computer to others. And we excluded infant with previous chromosome or um, brand malformation, hypoxic ischemic, and fourth one, which is not there, which is metabolic. We excluded all pyridoxine dependent, meloptinum cofactor, biotinidase uh, uh, deficiency. And um, we make like, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, characterize all phenotypes in detail, EEG, as much as we can. So in total, we have around 126 patients. Uh, sorry, we, in total we have 220, 200 patients, all with unexplained epileptic encephalopathy from two centers. When we did the holixome and panel, we find the result in 126 patients, which is 58% um, to be autosomal recessive, and uh, around uh, eight patients only, they have autosomal dominance. So mostly of our cost cases were autosomal recessive. And there was 37%, which is still unknown from those. And uh, when we, I compare with another studies from Lancet Neurology 2015, the epileptic encephalopathy causes, you know, this is the genetically still unexplained. So still we have like, you know, only 37%, which is unknown. Inshallah, we'll know it later. Um, this slide showed the most frequent gene notice in our study. 
So the most uh, one was SLC 13A5, followed there is a FARS1 and ADAT3 uh, three gene. Dr. Fozan talked about it yesterday and I will little um, elaborate more it. And other gene, most of them are autosomal recessive disorder. Um, AB3B2, it is an um, adapter gene, and it, it is from the adaptinopathies now, what they call it later. It's those patients usually present with severe developmental delay, poor vision contact, and optic atrophy, postnatal microcephaly. Um, I will talk not about each one, just about the most important and some of lesson from it. Um, this case is, or this gene, SLC13A5. We have around eight patients, and all of them, they present with a neonatal seizure within the first 24 hour of age. All of them had intractable seizure, teeth hypoplasia, borderline microcephaly, delayed development. All of them, they have multifocal seizure. MRI was unremarkable. We find one novel gene in them, a uh, novel mutation, and um, regarding this gene, the SLC13A5, it, is, it encodes a highly affinity sodium channel citrate transport, and they find that if you give citrate, you will increase the level of citrate in the mitochondrial matrix that may lead to increased efflux of citrate from matrix to the cytoplasm. This increasing allow to malf the malfunction of the citrate to be bypassed. We give citrate for those patients. There is limited improvement. Uh, just remember that their seizures were really intractable, not responding to around four antiepileptic drugs. But after citrate, after ketogenic diet, they improve a little bit. Our cases is only eight, so we need more cases to elaborate more about the treatment. This is the, another case. I would like to say that I again listen from this um, family pedigree, which I did in maybe 2018, uh, sorry, 2011. First, that you don't take guarantee from mothers that when she say there is no family history of similar problem. Then we find that there is 10. And then the second thing, don't guarantee when the mother says there is no consanguinity. Because m many of our population, they think that maternal consanguinity is not consanguinity. So they don't think that they are, if they are cousin from mother, mother side, they are cousins. So you have to ask about this in particular, particular. What is the relation between your mothers? Because otherwise, no one will volunteer to say there is a problem. So actually, you'll find this was um, a struggling case. The neurology just sent it to me, and they told me, we fed up. We don't know what's going with all of them. This patient had severe uh, epileptic encephalopathy followed with this one, microcephaly. This was mild and turned to be normal. This one has spastic uh, sorry, encephalopathy and this one, the new one as well. So um, we struggle with them and I send them as usual to Dr. Fozan, alhamdulillah. And then after two years or some, we find the, the, study, the gene. The other case also it is the same and I want to show you that they didn't look like each other. This girl really has dysmorphism. She has uh, spastic, uh, sorry, uh, epileptic encephalopathy, seizures, not responding. She has severe cognition delay. So all of them, all of those, they are related or they are, they share the intellectual and disability, strabismus, growth failure, microcephaly, epilepsy, and all of them, they have the same mutation in the SLC, uh, sorry, ADAT3 gene. So this is another one of the diseases that we have to think out and turned to be the most common autosomal recessive disorder causing mental retardation in Saudi Arabia. And Dr. Fazan is saying like this, yes, so it's right. And the other one, which is also again another problem patient with us, he had presented with um, early spasticity. Refer to me because of arthrogryposis. Thought that this is arthrogryposis, and this is actually not arthrogryposis, it's only spasticity which was so severe in association with early epilepsy, microcephaly, and we find this gene, um, the WWOX gene, which was previously thought it is um, a gene for the cancer, and then um, the phenotype expanded to know that it is associated with spasticity and uh, intellectual disabilities, plus epileptic encephalopathy. We find after it's five cases, and all of them died in early infancy, all of them they have severe, profound developmental delay, severe failure to thrive. The message from this was that we have to think about it. Maybe some of them, they were misdiagnosed as arthrogryposis and passed away without any, uh, without any testing. We offer the, patient, the parent uh, PGD later on. 
So we try to, from a neurology side, to see if there's any genotype, phenotype with the, um, the disease. So they say like the infantile spasm come more with AB3P2 or ARV1, ARFG, EF2. I will not say all of them, but some of them, they have really uh, specific semiology of the seizure. Some, they can happen, whatever, and uh, any seizure can happen with it. Um, in comparison to other studies, so most of our cases were autosomal recessive. So when we compare it to other studies, here in the genetic landscape, they find that most common cases were de novo. Another study in 2015, sorry, 2016 in China, they say also most of cases were de novo. Another study in 2016, and it's uh, one, around 100 cases, 10, and 28% per, were, again, de novo. So in the, in the other countries, most of the epileptic encephalopathy, they have autosomal dominant, whereas in our country, in our study, showed that autosomal recessive is the most common cause. The treatment is important, the genetic test is important for treatment because some, you know, several factors considered in searching for candidate gene. And um, this genetic study showed for some of the cases that the drug which was given, it's not functioning well, may, go, may cause toxicity. And the gene, genetic study for some cases showed us what is the mutation, how the mutation causes the disease and some of the loss of function gene mutation happen to have another drug that when we when you use it, it imp the patient improve and his seizure improve. Um, so we talk, we reach now our the last um, uh, slide, last two slides. Our study provide that the first time comprehensive epidemiological information epilepsy phenotype and recessive gene on a large cohort of early onset epileptic encephalopathy. The diagnosis by the genetic is very important for the prognosis, for the understanding of the disease itself, for prevention, and for treatment. For treatment, in our case, with those cases, the SLC 13A5, we started ketogenic diet, oral citrate, and some improvement after this. In the KCNA2, um, we start acetazolamide, and the patient improve after this treatment. Um, the genetic counseling is very important. I have one poster about AFG L3, AFG3 L2, whereas the, our population, you give them the, the, the diagnosis, you offer them the premarital screening and the PGD, and still they go and marry each other uh, in spite of everything. So we find that we need more also, more explanation. How is the explanation will change their their collective consciousness, if you want to say, there is a lot of collective consciousness that guide our population and need more and more work on it uh, by the genetic study, by collaboration, and by uh, increased awareness of the doctors and others. I would like in my, uh, to thank, in, my, uh, in the end of um, my talk, Dr. Brahim Tabaraki, our neurologist, Dr. Fozan Kriya, Dr. Ala Eskandrani, she's the neurologist uh, working with us in this um, uh, research all doctors and collaborators and pediatric department in my hospital. Thank you very much.